talk today about the chi-square test, or you can see that little symbol there for the Greek symbol chi, and it's the chi-square test. Hopefully you have your notes in front of you, and we're ready to start. The chi-square test is used to test the counts of categorical data. Up until now, all the different tests that we've been talking about, means and proportions, have been dealing with numerical data. Now we're going to start talking about how can you test categorical data. There are three types of chi-square tests. The type we're going to talk about today in this lesson is goodness of fit, which is for one variable univariate data. On Monday and next week we'll talk about independence and homogeneity. Independence is when you have two sets of data, bivariate, or homogeneity when you have one set of data but two samples from that set of data. The chi-square distribution looks something like this. It is very similar to the t-test in that it counts with degree it comes with degrees of freedom. So when you have a degree of freedom of 3, the distribution of the chi-square would look like this and you can see that this is not a normal distribution in any way shape or form. However, as the degree of freedom gets bigger, it starts looking more and more like it's approximately normal. In this regard, it's very similar to the T distribution. As the degree of freedom gets bigger, it becomes more and more normal. You can see the difference is that it starts out extremely skewed for a very low degree of freedom. The characteristics of the chi-square distribution. First, different degrees of freedom, or different DFs, have different curves, and we just saw three of them. It will be skewed right, unless the degree of freedom gets really, really big, in which case it looks normal. And as the degree of freedom increases, the curve shifts towards the right and becomes more like a normal curve. So the previous picture that we just talked about, I just showed you, gives you an illustration of that and how that occurs. It will only have positive values. Right, and that's one that's a little bit different with a t-square. This a chi-square is our t-distribution will have both positive and negatives, and a z-distribution can have both positive and negatives, but the chi-square will only have positives. The assumptions for a chi-square test are a confidence interval. First, it must be an SRS, a reasonably random sample. You must have counts of categorical data, and every category has to happen at least once. We have to have that expectation and the sample size. To ensure that the sample size is large enough, we should expect at least five in each category. So if we have a listing of different categories like we did with the dice game or with the M&Ms, we have to expect at least five in every category, and every category must be expected to happen at least once. All right, combine these together, and all expected counts are at least five. That's one of our assumptions. Here's the formula for the chi-square formula, and you can see it's observed minus expected squared divided by expected, and then you add all of those sums together. We wrote that down earlier on our earlier sheet as well. Now, for the goodness of fit test, it uses univariate data. We want to see how well the observed counts fit into what we expect the, the counts to be and it uses chi-squared CDF, low, high, and then degrees of freedom on the calculator to find the p-values. This is what we did today in class with the dice and with the M&Ms. The goodness of fit is completely based on the degrees of freedom, and very similarly to what we saw in the t-distributions, the degree of free of freedom is the number of categories minus one. If you're going to do a chi-square test, you have to have some hypotheses. Unlike with the, with the means or with the proportions where we wrote symbols, with a chi-square test, we want to write our hypotheses in words. So the null hypothesis is that the observed counts equal the expected counts, and you'd want to provide context to the problem. And then the null, the alternate would be that the observed counts are not equal to the expected counts. Those two phrasings are always the same for goodness of fit. The only thing that changes is the context that's being provided. All right, so be sure to write in context. I should not see you writing these two exact same phrases. You should be writing a different phrase for each problem based on the context provided to you in the problem. So for example, 
Does your zodiac sign determine how successful you will be? Fortune magazine collected the zodiac signs of 256 heads of the largest 400 companies. Is there sufficient evidence to claim that successful people are more likely to be born under some signs than others? And you can see the breakdown for the 256 people that they surveyed. How many would we expect in each sign if there were no difference between them? So if it were completely random and we survey 256 people and there are 12 months, 12 signs to divide them into, we would expect that every month would have an equal number, 256 divided by 12. That gives you 21.33333. That's what we would expect to happen. Now you can see that that's not what happened. If you look back at the chart that's there, you can see that we did not get 21.33333 in every single month. Some months were higher and some months were lower. And the question is, is there a big enough difference to say definitively whether you know, some successful people are more likely to be born under some signs. How many degrees of freedom would this have? Well, there's 12 signs, so the degree of freedom would be 12 minus 1, which would be 11. So here's our assumptions. We have a random sample of CEOs. The second one is that all expected counts are greater than 5. The expe expectation was 21.33 CEOs to be born in each sign. The null and the alternate the number of CEOs born under each sign is the same. The number of CEOs born under each sign is different. It shouldn't say the different, it just say is different. So you can see I wrote that in words instead of in symbols, and I provided context to the problem. The number of CEOs born under each sign. Calculate your chi-square statistic. So it's the observed minus the expected divided by the expected. And you square the top one, the numerator, and you add all those up and you get a chi-square statistic of 5.094. You can calculate your p-value with the chi-square CDF on your calculator. The lower is 5.094, the upper is 9999999999 with a degree of freedom of 11, and you get 0.9265 as the probability. With an alpha of 0.05, we would obviously fail to reject the null and say that there is not sufficient evidence to suggest that the CEOs are born under some sign, born under some signs more than others. So you can see the similarities between what we've done in the past, and then the little differences for a chi-square test. Right, let's do another example. A company says its premium mixture of nuts contains 10% Brazil nuts, 20% cashews, 20% almonds, 10% hazels, and 40% peanuts. You buy a large can, you separate the nuts, and upon weighing them, you find that there are 112 grams Brazil nuts, 183 grams of cashews, 207 grams of almonds, 71 grams of hazelnuts, and 446 grams of peanuts. You wonder whether your mix is significantly different than what the company advertises. So the first question is, why is the chi-square goodness of fit test not appropriate here? Does everyone see it? We don't have counts. Right? They're giving you the grams of nuts. They're not giving you the count of nuts. So therefore, we could not use a chi-square goodness of fit test in this situation. What could we do instead of weighing the nuts in order to use a chi-square? Well, obviously, if we need the count, we would count the number of each type of nut and perform a chi-square test. Very much like what we did with the M&Ms in class today. Okay, another example. Offspring of certain fruit, fry, fruit flies may have yellow or ebony bodies and normal wings or short wings. Genetic theory predicts that these traits will appear in the ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. If any of you are taking biology, I'm sure you've seen these sorts of things before. And you can see the breakdown of the different types of fruit flies. A researcher checks 100 such flies and he finds the distribution of traits to be 59, 20, 30, 11, and 10 respectively. So to do a chi-square first, what are the expected counts and what are the degrees of freedom? Well, if, there, if the ratio is 9, 3, 3, 1, that adds up to 16. So we would expect 9 out of 16 to have yellow and normal wings. And we would expect then going the rest of the way, 3 out of 16 to have yellow and short, 3 out of 16 to have ebony and normal, and 1 out of 16 to have ebony and short. And that breaks down to the expected counts based on 9 16 for the top one, 3 16 for the second one, 3 16 for the third one, and 1 16 for 
the last one out of 100. There are four categories, so the degree of freedom is 3. Are these results consistent with the theoretical distribution predicted by the genetic model? In order to answer this question, we're going to have to do the full chi-square test. So, our assumptions. First, we must assume that we have a random sample of fruit flies. The second one is that all expected counts are greater than 5, and here they are. If you're going, whenever you do this assumption and you make that, say, that statement, all expected counts are greater than 5, you need to write the counts. You need to tell me what the expected counts are. You cannot just make that statement without backing it up with some data. The hypothesis, the null hypothesis, is that the distribution of fruit flies is the same as the theoretical model. The alternate is that the distribution of fruit flies is not the same as the theoretical model. These are pretty easy hypotheses. You just have to write them out in words. Calculate your chi-square statistic. Observe minus expected squared divided by expected. You do that for each one of our four categories. Add them all up. You get 5.671. Do chi-square CDF on your calculator and you get a probability of 0.129. At an alpha level of 5%, our conclusion is, since the p-value is greater than alpha, I fail to reject the null. There is not sufficient evidence to suggest that the distribution of fruit flies is not the same as the theoretical model. And that is a full chi-square test with a good conclusion, and you've shown all your work. Your turn. For homework tonight, after you finish taking these notes, here is a sample question and I want you to use a chi-square test to answer this question completely and when you come into class tomorrow we will talk about it. That's all, bro.